When I was a young adult, I was very impressed by what I considered to be the Jesus fable. Wonderful story of a, a fellow who lived, who had a great perception of how people ought to behave, but it was just a story, kind of like the Greek myths I'd read about in high school or any of the other religions of the world that were based on nice stories, but that was all. But then I read a couple books that challenged my outlook. One of them was simply a science fiction book that tried to explain how time travel created a new Jesus. A fellow went back in time, discovered Galilee about the time of the Romans, and found a fellow who was called Jesus, but he wasn't much of a uh, miracle worker. So this guy who time traveled assumed the role of Jesus, therefore fulfilling history. You wonder why that struck me? This was the first time I'd really considered that Jesus lived at a specific time in Roman history, in our history. The next book explained, well, quite frankly, it was called The Passover Plot, how a bunch of Jewish disciples of this rabbi named Jesus stole the body or pretended Jesus died, what have you. Again, what struck me was here's serious, well, semi-serious, study of what I thought was just a myth. People were regarding this time in history as real history. They were trying to explain away a real person named Jesus. Later on, I listened to the, uh, the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, and one of the lines that Judas has given, who's kind of a skeptic, says something to the effect, why'd you choose such a backward time and such a small nation? Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. Even in my skepticism, in my thinking that Christianity was based on just a story rather than on a historical fact, I thought to myself, well, if it weren't for the Christians, there wouldn't be such a thing as mass communication. The, exp the, the discoveries, the scientific advances that were made by Western Europeans were because they happened to believe that there was a God who had created a logical world that people could understand. Well, all that is how I came to realize that apparently Jesus was historical. Therefore, somebody had to explain how the entire world was really changed by a bunch of people who kept insisting, even to the point of death, that they had seen the risen, once killed, now alive, Jesus. This week's Sunday School lesson is focused on the earliest convincing proofs of Jesus. Uh, you can go to any of the Gospels and get one of the stories. We'll be focused on John's Gospel today, and let's start with John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who'd reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, that's an interesting phrase about the one Jesus loved, which would be John. He saw and believed, but still didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. What exactly did he believe? That the tomb was empty, 
see the the empty tomb by itself just caused more confusion. Mary thought they'd stolen the body. Peter saw it, understood the body wasn't there, and John believed something, but apparently not believed the, the possibility of the resurrection yet. Well, is that surprising? How are we supposed to treat this idea of someone we saw not just die, but killed, a spear thrust in his side, and now he's alive? Well, the empty tomb was the first indication that something was different, but they still didn't know what it was. What could have been going through their minds? There was an understanding among many Jews, not the Sadducees, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in a spiritual dimension, uh, the soul that we would talk about. And I don't want to get into that definition, but uh, the whole concept of something living beyond the body just did not appeal to them. They did not believe it. But the other Jewish um, scholars and the bulk of the people understood that in the last days, there would be a resurrection of the dead. But they weren't quite ready for that to be happening either. So what did this mean? That there was an empty tomb, and of course the disciples had heard Jesus mention from time to time, and after three days, but really? Now, it would be a good time just to reflect. What would an empty tomb mean in a world that did not know? did not believe, did not really believe that someone's going to come back to life after being killed by Roman torturers. It took a little while, a little more convincing, and it was not just the empty tomb. It was Jesus, continuing in John. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. This was hard for the early disciples, and for Mary especially. We've got to explain this unusual circumstance somehow, and so the easiest explanation is somebody took the body. That's where Mary still was. Not certain what John and Peter believed. John's one who said he believed already. But what was it he believed, since he didn't understand the resurrection yet? It's been pointed out that the resurrected body, this is just a little aside here, the resurrected body is going to be different from what we've experienced already. Otherwise, surely, even through her tears, Mary would have recognized Jesus if he were exactly the same as he'd been three or four days, well, four or five days before. So there's something different about a resurrected body. Uh, later on, uh, Luke's passage tells us that some people walking along the road to Emmaus walked with Jesus, didn't recognize him somehow. Again, You've got to account for the fact that people didn't expect to see Jesus, but they did not recognize him at first when they did see him. So Mary has met Jesus, but still wonders what has happened to his body. Who stole it? Where, did it, where was it taken? John continues to explain. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary, 
she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It took an actual encounter with the still living Christ before Mary really understood that he really still lives. That's what it takes for the other disciples. They heard Mary's testimony. We're not going to read all the passages and it takes it from different gospels, but you know the stories. They did not believe until he appeared to them, spoke to them. Thomas is the one we know the most because it took him a week, even with everybody else saying they'd seen the Jesus. It took a personal encounter. And that's what it took for me. I understood the historical Jesus, but it wasn't until on a dark road in Appalachia, traveling by myself across country, I finally came to grips with the fact that if this Jesus actually lived and died, if these stories were true, then he had a claim on my life. I accepted that, and sure enough, he began working. I did not receive what you would call the witness of the Spirit for several months, but there came a day when I suddenly realized that he had accepted my repentance, accepted my confession, accepted me as a child of God, and he had begun to work in me. It's the personal encounter with the living Christ that finally convinced Mary, that eventually convinced the disciples. And once they were convinced, the world was turned upside down. Now, what does this personal encounter, what, what are these first day events have for us today? I wanted to, to raise a few questions based upon these scripture passages. Uh, first off, one of the tricky ones, don't hold on to me because I ascend to the Father. Jesus' um, explanation there to, to Mary. How interesting. She's just discovered the living Christ. And now he says, but this is not how it's going to be. We, we've been living this way for so long, all of us in, in this part of history, uh, we know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, that the relationship we now have is through his Spirit. But Mary, and perhaps many of the early disciples, kept expecting that Jesus himself was going to appear with them. I mean, he's, he's been raised from the dead. Why not continue to stay with them? Uh, after all, God can do all sorts of things. Why couldn't he just make it possible for Jesus to be everywhere? Apparently, that's what the church is supposed to be. Paul tells us that we are becoming, in fact, we already are the body of Christ. We are the Christ that others are supposed to be experiencing. That in order to see how the Father works through Jesus, the world's supposed to be able to look at us and see how he works through his church, his Jesus friends today. That's a sobering reflection. It's very important, very important for us to introduce people to Jesus himself, but they're going to meet us first. How do we live out the Jesus life in such a way that people see the resurrected Jesus, the power of the resurrected Jesus through us? Good questions, I think. I'm not sure of the answers. I kind of wish we were all together because I just love to get a good discussion going and, and hear what, what your thoughts are on this and how you've seen Jesus at work through others and how you, I know it sounds a little braggadocio, but it's important to know how Jesus has worked through you to show others that he is today.
living and reigning. Well, Mary received instructions to go and tell. When we've met Jesus, isn't that just kind of natural? When we have had any sort of a, a great experience, we want to share it. Based on Facebook, it may be more natural for us to share the latest bird sighting, um, the good moon. Yeah, that's what I posted the other night, the uh, picture of the big moon. Uh, what about the transforming power of Jesus? Question, is it possible that we have stopped testifying so much because we have stopped experiencing the new changes he's still making in us or wants to make in us. Just a question and probably more for my benefit than yours, but it's a question. So what does that say about our need to meet with Jesus regularly and deeply? Finally, the personal encounter made the difference for Mary. How can we help people have such an encounter? We have to help them get to the point of initial recognition that, that Jesus is real, that Jesus exists, that he's historical, that all these things. But it's also important to have them encounter him personally. And then we need to encourage them and ourselves to keep that encounter fresh. Well, the good news is that he is risen. And he is risen indeed.